that was so special. Um, I can't believe there's only a couple more hours of youth on left. This is insane. We're coming to some of the final hours, but the presentations just keep getting better and better. Um, the whole time, this whole time uh, we've been together, they just have been outstanding. Um, and that's going to be a similar trend for this next group that I am teeing up as well. So let me quickly promote them um, to panelists. And then um, we can actually, if everyone is ready on the team, can start and get going and then squeeze as much great conversation time in as possible. Yay, we're seeing some awesome faces. Hello. More. All right, hello. I think I have everyone. Yay, okay, awesome. So they're gonna introduce themselves, but I couldn't be you know, more honored, um, more excited to have Reserva the Youth Land Trust with us and some special guest members. Um, it's pretty early for a couple of them. So uh, if you're watching here on the chat here on Zoom or on YouTube, um, or even if you're coming to us you know, from your phone and you aren't actually in the, the chat, give them love, give them some some good vibes on Instagram um, because they're, they're doing some crazy cool work. So without further ado, here they are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bailey. Um, first of all, Jonathan, it looks like you're the only man in America who's managed to get a haircut. Um, I did it myself last week and that <laughs> was an adventure. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. Well, um, my name is Callie Bradas. Um, I am the founder and executive director of Reserva, the Youth Land Trust. Um, and we're joined here today by a panel of three of our amazing youth council members, as well as my friend, Dr. Jonathan Colby. Um, and they're going to be leading an incredible panel on um, exploring your backyard ecosystems, the ecosystems around you, especially those related um, and, and near fresh water. Um, so at first, I just want to give you a quick one minute description of what Reserva is and why we're all together uh, before handing it over to Jonathan, who's going to mo uh, moderate um, this panel. So um, Reserva is an organization, it's called Reserva the Youth Land Trust, and we're an organization that is dedicated to empowering youth through land conservation, education, and storytelling. So we're led by a youth council, an international youth council from about 15 countries around the world. Um, and it's currently led by about 56 members, um, three of whom you see here. And uh, what they do is they um, fundraise for our main project, which I'll mention in a second. Um, they, lead pro uh, they lead projects that um, support our in-country partner, both through education, storytelling, and community well-being support. Um, and then they also are speakers and, um, you know, storytellers like, like what we're doing today. Um, and then they, they, as I said, they support our main project, which is um, a partnership with a group called the Rainforest Trust. And what we're trying to do is create the world's first entirely youth funded nature reserve. Um, it's gonna be an area in, um, in the Ecuadorian Choco, about 244 acres uh, as part of a 1,219 acre planned expansion to an existing reserve. The, the plot is in the Ecuadorian cloud forest, which is one of the most threatened and biodiverse regions in the world. And it's actually an area that Daniela, one of our panelists is going to study, um, studies in, uh, right now, um, and she'll tell us about in a second. Um, and, uh, and the area uh, connects two disjointed parcels of an existing reserve. So it's a really important uh, site. It's habitat to critically endangered um, spider monkeys and uh, toads and frogs and orchids and um, one of the most endangered plants in all of Ecuador. So um, if you are interested in supporting that, um, please visit us at ReservaYLT.org or find us on social media at, at ReservaYLT. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that um, we know not everyone has the ability to donate money, um, if, especially right now, it's a tough time. Uh, but we created a program called the One Million Letters Campaign that lets you support this project regardless of your ability to donate. What we're asking you to do is write a letter saying what you love about nature 
and why world governments need to step up and commit to protecting our last wild places. Um, as Bailey just said, we need to protect at least 30% of our planet by 2030. And we've teamed up with the National Geographic Campaign for Nature uh, to support that with this campaign. So when you write your letter, we will not only collect your letter to send to uh, world governments at the Convention on Biological Diversity, but we'll also match your letter with $3 toward the reserve so your voice can actually protect rainforest. So again, it's just reservawild.org. Um, and with that, I am gonna shut off my video and kind of get out of your hair. And then I would love to hand it over to Jonathan. And if y'all can go through and just introduce yourself briefly and then, um, and then kick it off, that'd be great. So thank you. I'm gonna be moderating the, um, the chat. So if anyone has questions about Reserva or um, uh, questions about the site, I can answer them while they're chatting. So thanks. All right, I guess that's me. So yeah, so as Kylie said, thanks for all coming here today. First, we'll just ask um, each of our presenters to, to introduce themselves briefly and then we'll kick it off. Um, so yeah, first we've got James, do you want to ask who you are? Yeah, so yeah, I'm James, I'm 16 and um, I live in Surrey in the UK. And um, yeah, I'm about to start my uh, final year of school studying biology, chemistry, and maths, and then hopefully on to university to study uh, biology in the future. And I'm really interested in um, biological recording, um, particularly of the, the less popular groups, perhaps, in conservation circles, and just how important that is in conservation. Fantastic, thanks. And Daniela. Hi, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daniela Franco. I'm from Ecuador. I'm 22 years old. I'm studying biodiversity and genetic resources. Uh, I am in the last year, uh, especially I'm working with frogs in the part of biogenetic part, and also in the biodiversity of the Andean frogs of Ecuador. Wonderful. Thanks. And Thank Andy. Hi, my name is Andy. Um, I guess I'm just really interested in studying entomology, mycology. Uh, I'm just a naturalist who's grown up here in Colorado. I'm 20 years old, but my family originally comes from Ecuador. So I visit there a lot and I have a really good connection with um, the cloud forest in Ecuador, which I absolutely love. Wonderful, thanks. And myself, as Kelly mentioned, my name is Jonathan Colby. I'm the director of the Honduras Amphibian Rescue and Conservation Center. Um, I, I used to formally work with the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, studying science and policy with the international wildlife trade. But uh, my main focus is the spread of diseases that cause extinctions in amphibians around the world. And yeah, so let's, let's get this started. So from the freshwater streams of England and the United States to the misty cloud forests of Ecuador, exploration often requires getting muddy. It's also incredibly fun, but it can be hard to know where to begin if you're a young person just starting to literally get your feet wet in science. But today we're joined by three incredible young scientists and they're each going to share about how they got into science and exploration and what field interests them most. So if you have questions for James, Daniela and Andy as they're presenting, just submit them in the Q&A box below and we'll answer them at the end of the session. So first, let's hear from James in the UK. Go ahead, James. Okay, so I'd like to sort of describe my, my progression through natural history as some sort of journey through different taxonomic groups, so different groups of organisms. It's hard to sort of pinpoint where I first started in sort of biodiversity and exploring it, but I suppose being on safari when I was five or six sort of opened my eyes to birds and mammals first, because they're the ones that are more obvious to me and they're easier to identify, but sort of as I got older, I sort of uh, paid more attention to sort of the beetles and the bugs that are in my garden that moved on to stuff like plants and bryophytes and fungi. And sort of going on these field meetings with people who are so, in, um, so intelligent and so knowledgeable about these groups sort of really just planted more seeds in my mind as to, as to all the amazing biodiversity that there is out there. So at the moment I've sort of got my, my toe in loads of different pools of amazing um, taxonomic groups. I sort of, I tried to focus on a few, but it's so hard to, to, to keep track of them. But 
and just goes to show how important biological recording is because a lot of the groups that I'm most interested in in the moment are, are stuff like beetles and wasps that don't really get that much attention from recorders but it's just so important because if you think of um, a lot of the main means of conservation so stuff like captive breeding programs reintroduction all of these things wouldn't be possible without biological recording because if you want to captive breed an organism you need to know what sort of breeding conditions they need and what sort of the food that they need to survive and stuff like this and this is all the data that can be gleaned from their all important biological records and to the other extreme sort of if a, if a species isn't even described yet there's absolutely no hope of conserving it so that's why biological recording is so important and sort of on a more aquatic basis um, the aquatic ecosystem sort of they can provide an early warning system as to what's sort of happening in the environment so say if you've got a river and upstream there's a factory that's that's pumping pollutants after a few months or years you might notice the water becoming more murky there'll be a more noticeable sort of death around um, than from like a passerby but if you're doing biological recording and monitoring of this ecosystem you can tell by the species assemblages what sort of effects this factory is having on the ecosystem so quite a lot of the the groups that are found in these ecosystems so stuff like mayflies caddisflies they only survive in the purest of water and um, you've even got some unusual ones that will actually benefit from low levels of these sort of toxins that are coming in. So if you monitor this and you see like a decrease in the, the populations of the midges or caddisflies that love this pure water and an increase in those very unusual species that um, prefer these toxins, it's quite unusual, but it's amazing. But you sort of monitor this and if you see that change and you, there's, you can be alert of these factories further upstream that are pumping these toxins in and stem that because that could be absolutely catastrophic if you caught it any later. And even some invertebrates can provide, provide a material quantitative way of judging the toxins that are present in an ecosystem. So mollusks like mussels, they have a filter feeding system that sort of filters out the nutrients from the water. And these filters will collect these toxins in the river, in the river. And these can be sampled by scientists and you can see exactly what compounds are present within these um, water systems. So that's just incredible. And, and I've been quite lucky in being able to, to get involved in biological recording quite easily. So I'd like to sort of pass that on a bit and just go through a few methods that other people can use to get into recording aquatic ecosystems. So one of the first ones that may come to mind when you think about sampling aquatic ecosystems is pond dipping. So that involves getting a net like this one, sort of um, quite long handles because you don't want to be dipping into the water yourself. You just want to dip this net in. It's got quite a quite a sturdy net bag in here. So you, you put it into the water and move it in a figure of eight configuration through the vegetation. And this will collect all the sort of invertebrates that are, that are living on this vegetation. Then you invert the net bag into a white tray, which makes it so much easier to see all these invertebrates that are in the water. And I actually went out and, and did some pond dipping this morning. I was amazed at what I found because I only dipped my pond, dip, uh, pond dipping net in for one or two strokes. I found so many incredible things. So I found this, this damselfly larva. I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to see that, but this is what one of these uh, damselflies are going to go into. Um, also a couple of large water beetles. This one was really active earlier, so I'm not sure if it's going to perform from the camp for the camera this time, but... Uh, we've got a water beetle in there. And my, my, my most amazing find, I was so excited by this because this isn't one that I've seen before, but it's actually a species of leech. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to, to see that in there, but it's a very narrow leech. Now you can just see it near the bottom of the pot there. And um, you may be surprised to know that there are um, dozens of species of leeches in the UK in temperate climates. Um, so not just restricted to tropical biomes, but you don't need to worry, I, I don't mean to alarm you because there's only one species in the UK that can actually feed on mammals, that can actually sort of puncture the skin of, of large mammals, and that's a medicinal leech. And because of exploitation by, by um, medicine, particularly in the 19th century, it's actually become quite rare. So you don't need to worry, but conservationists will worry. I'm, I'm sure people worry in that respect, but you won't find leeches biting if you start sampling aquatic systems, unless you're in Kent or the New Forest. But yeah, it's still really cool. So this is actually a fish leech, and this will feed on fish, obviously, because that's its, that's its name. And you've also got ones that are predatory, so it'll kill invertebrates, and also ones that feed on frogs and amphibians. 
Um, but so pond dipping is something that obviously takes place on the shore. We can also dive right, or maybe not literally, but you can dive in and actually do something called kick something. So you don a pair of waders or Wellington boots and get into the get into the river, and you get a net like this one. It's going to be the frame is going to be not quite as circular, but rather flat on one side, and so it's sort of a, a semicircular shape. And this flat side will be laid flush to the riverbed. And you stand upstream and sort of kick the, the sediment and rocks that are sort of at the bottom of the riverbed. And uh, this will disturb all the invertebrates that are living in there. And they'll flow downstream into the net. So you can invert that just like you would with pond dipping and see all these amazing invertebrates in the white tray, which is sort of a, a completely different assemblage to what you might find in pond dipping. Um, but let's say you don't have any water sources nearby, you don't have any sort of lakes or ponds or rivers, but you can still, you can still engage in aquatic recording. Because say if you lived in a, in a flat, um, in an apartment block in the middle of a city, and on the roof there was patches of wet moss. Now you can get these mosses and find uh, these amazing organisms called tardigrades, and which can enter this sort of stage of advanced hibernation called cryptobiosis where they can withstand temperatures as low as minus 200 degrees Celsius, up to 151 degrees Celsius. You can take them and um, dive into the deepest depths of the ocean, multiply the pressure there by six, they'd still survive. You can blast them with 1,000 times the amount of X-ray radiation than we can withstand, and they'll be fine. You can take them up in a rocket ship, throw them into a vacuum of space, they'll be fine and they can survive with, for months without oxygen, and even for an aquatic organism, decades without water. And so what's so amazing about these, along with all these amazing um, pressures that they can withstand, that they can be found pretty much in any sort of wet moss or lichen or anything like that. So if you went up onto the roof, found, found a patch of wet moss, put that in a paper bag so it dries out a little, um, and take that home. And once you've, once you've got home, put this, um, a bit of wet moss in a plastic container. It's like a Petri dish or a blister packet for pills and soak it in water for about a day. If you're really keen, maybe you can cut it down to eight hours and then that'll be just about okay. But then you squeeze um, this, this moss after that period of time onto another plastic container, like a Petri dish or a, a cavity slide. And they're sort of, they're about submicroscopic, so they're about half the size of a full stop or a period. And so they're probably about at the maximum reaches of the human naked eye, but um, they're best seen under a sort of a stereo microscope or a compound microscope, and they're just incredible things. So they're also called uh, water bears because of their appearance. So they've got um, these tiny little stubby legs, they're quite tubular and, and chubby, and oh, they're just they're just brilliant to watch, along with um, the amazing facts about their cryptobiosis. But um, say you don't have any molecules of water in your surrounding area at all. I know it's a bit extreme and it might be a bit concerning, but say there's no, there's no water anywhere near you. Funnily enough, you can still record aquatic in, uh, invertebrates because uh, as I was gonna say earlier, um, so the organisms that live there, many of them don't often spend their whole life cycles within the water ecosystem. So stuff like dragonflies, sound supplies, once they become adults, they'll, they'll leave the ecosystem and sort of um, enter the terrestrial ecosystems and sort of have huge impacts on the food chains there. So this is where um, if you're living many kilometers from an actual water source, you can still record these invertebrates that are coming out and uh, often dispersing quite widely. So techniques like sweep netting, it's a similar principle to the pond dipping that I, I demonstrated, but you have a light net bag and you sweep it through the terrestrial vegetation. And you can find so many things um, that would have started their life cycles in the aquatic environment. And also another one of my favorite things is light trapping. It's also called moth trapping, but it, it, it catches so many more things than just moths. So stuff like caddisflies and water beetles, which disperse at night, they'll be attracted to this light. Um, and then you can sort of find it in the morning. It's amazing because you can do it while you sleep. But um, in the morning when you check the moth trap, you can find all these amazing things and see what's been dispersing around. So even if you can't go and directly assess the quality of a water ecosystem by by sampling that. You can still sort of assess whether there might be any damage um, being done to that if you see a change in the population of adult caddisflies or dragonflies that are visiting a local terrestrial ecosystem. Um, I suppose my, my final thing would be just to stay aware because you never really know when you might, might have a chance to record these aquatic ecosystems. So even if your car, if you have one, is out in your driveway on a hot summer's day, 
water beetles passing by will think that the shiny roof of your car is, is a pond or a lake. So they'll start dive bombing it. And um, it's the same for shiny patio tiles as well. So um, you never know when you might, might have a chance to submit these vital biological records. But I'd really encourage anybody, if they can, to, to submit biological records, because as I said, it's such a vital means of conservation. Yeah. Thanks, James. That was superb. So I was gonna ask you a question about how, how it feels working with a group of animals like aquatic invertebrates that aren't big and fancy and showy and like easy to get excited about and, and how, how it is that you work to get people interested and excited. But quite frankly, I feel like you partly already answered that for me because just by watching you and hearing you get excited, I'm excited about the leech you found. I mean, for any scientist to be like, I am so excited I found this skinny little leech. And, and, but do you have anything to add to that? How is it working with a group of animals that traditionally a lot of people have a hard time getting excited about and you want them to get excited? It's so true. Like going into conversations with my um, school friends, for example, they'll be talking about flies and stuff and how they find it all disgusting and stuff. But just, just entering this sort of, these amazing facts about these organisms like leeches that people don't really know about, but just entering these into normal conversations, they, some, they sort of gain a, an awareness for how amazing they are and exactly how important they are to conserve and record and stuff like that. So like if you saw um, a fly buzzing against your kitchen window, many other people would just think, oh, it's just a fly, it's just feeding on dead things and stuff. It doesn't really have any importance in the world, but there are so many amazing facts that you could tell about this fly that can really get people um, excited about it. So just bringing these into daily usage would be, be incredible and sort of getting people involved and inspired to record and conserve. Thanks, that's, that's superb. And one last really quick question. How many species of invertebrates have you identified in the UK? Well, I have to get this right. It's 3,766 as of today with that new uh, common fish leech, which I found this morning, which I was so excited about. So yeah, well, nearly at 4,000. So yeah, pretty happy with that. <laughs> good job. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna continue onwards. And next up is Daniela, over to you. <laughs> well, I'm fine. Well, I have a presentation for you. I'm going to share my screen. I don't know you. Okay. I'm going to present to you the study frogs from Fiberg in the cloud forest to the lab in Ecuador. <clears throat> First, uh, Ecuador is located in South America. If you see in this map, uh, Ecuador has a lot of biodiversity and is considered one of the most uh, biodiverse countries in the world. Uh, due to the high diversity, diversity of their natural species, the country has around uh, 23,000 taxonomic species recognized in the world. Also, this biodiversity uh, with readiness is determined by its geographical, uh, atmospheric, and climatic uh, biodiversity location. If you can see, Ecuador have three regions, uh, the coast, Andes, and the Amazon rainforest. Today, uh, I'm going to present to you the cloud forest that is the uh, one of the part that I study. Uh, the cloud forest uh, is a term that refers to a group of ecosystems located on the slopes of the mountain areas, whose main characteristic is the high humidity and precipitation uh, throughout uh, the year. Also, uh, a high incidence of dominant by epiphytes, such as orchids, uh, ferns, and rodents. Okay, how about frogs? In frogs and toads in the world, we have uh, 7,213 species. But in Ecuador, uh, we have 622 species, and this is, we are in the third in the world with a lot of species of frogs. If you see, I have some species like the Fergus colomite, this is a glass frog, uh, this is a guacamayo toad, and an atelopus rostris. This atelopus is appeared in science in 2015. Okay, what well, we need to find frogs? It's easy to find frogs for me, and um, I think for you too. Uh, a headlamp, a good headlamp, we need We need a journal, a GPS. Uh, I think that my best friend is the boots, and also a comfortable uh, clothes. Where to find them? We can find them uh, in the top and the middle and in the low of the forest. Also, uh, 
the frogs are near to the rivers and in the streams. And what we do, uh, the, what we do is visual and contour surveys in the night and also in the day. If you can see in this picture, I need more to research more. And also uh, we locate people uh, to search frogs because we have junior frogs and night frogs. And in the night we, found, we can find more frogs. Uh, also uh, in this visual encounter surprise, uh, we're walking through a determinate area for a certain, a certain period, systematically searching for animals. We, call, we walk each example, sample transit with two researchers for a period of five or to 10 hours, and also we walk like 15 hours or more if it's necessary to find frogs. And next, uh, we have also to get geographic coordinators. If you can see, we found like this one is a, a tree frog in a tree. Uh, this is a common frog of the Chachis frogs of Ecuador and Colombia and Peru. It's a uh, Guana picturata. And the name of this frog is because the colors, if you see the colors of this frog is amazing. It's a yellow uh, with patterns with red and um, that. Also, we can find in the lopa, lopa of the of the forest uh, some pristimantis that are the rubber frogs. And then uh, the part that I can I want to show this video to you. Okay. This is a glass frog, it's a Yalonimatrachian aerobotatum from Ecuador. Uh, if you see the lay of the layers upside down and have a parental care, these are ecological data that is important to take uh, because it's more information for the species. You have always to count the eggs that we have, approximately, if you, uh, if you don't see, but they are uh, to 50 to 60 uh, eggs. Also, uh, we have uh, another video. This is a Pristimantis muricatus of Ecuador is a rubber frog and you can see always the prestimantis wearing the leaves or see if you see next uh, the most important part also is the sound recordings Okay, uh, this, te this, this technique is based on the vocalization emitted by adult males of frogs, which are specific to each species. Recorded individuals, individuals were observed, captured, and vocalizing males were recorded in previous established protocols that we have. Also, for each specimen captured, a unique record number was assigned, and the specimen was taken to the base camp in individual containers to confirm the, their sex or the age. Uh, to transport it to the camp, we also put the frogs in a, in a plastic bag with some word and leaves because it's important uh, that the frog uh, don't, didn't die in the, in, the, in the plastic bag. Also, uh, we have a photography records. Uh, they, this is important because to, we have to take photos of the dorsal to the lateral and, the, and to the <clears throat> and to the back part because uh, we have to recognize them in the when we describe a species it's important to know what characteristics the frog has in the life also if you can you can see this is in, uh, the lab in the file we always put a mini lab in the file to uh, the specimens management we mold all the individuals uh, that capture in the file camp in individual plastic bags that i said and we have to take in care daily. Uh, they have the necessary conditions with the word that is the most important for their survival. Uh, for your specimen data, we take in such a time of capture, also the type of vegetation, uh, where is what was captured, uh, the substrates, activity, and climate conditions, and there, and also the, the part that the most important is the you have to take the tissue of the specimen or the species, because then we go to the laboratory to, to do ADN. If you see, uh, this is the part that we have to put the, the code uh, to the specimen. And for me, it is not science if there is no data gathering. 
Then we have to go to the lab work that we in the lab work, the part that we do is to put in a museum all the specimens. If you can see in this part, uh, we have a lot of species in the museum. This is the Instituto Nacional de Biodiversidad of Ecuador, uh, that they have all the species of Ecuador. And you, when you, when you uh, have the species, you have to compare the, with another species to know if it's new or not. Okay, and the last part that we do is a DNA illustration. What is that? It's for species identification and phylogenetic analysis. Um, if you can see, um, they are growth, uh, the data that we have is we have no new species or not. But the discovery of the new species is not only by my own person, it's about many institutions like Ecominga Reserve that we have a lot of reserves in Ecuador and protect a lot of acres uh, in Ecuador. The Reserva de Yellow Trust, the Universidad de San Francisco de Quito, and the Instituto Nacional de Biodiversidad is a, this work is a team effort of many organizations like that. Uh, when we discover new species and auction their names to protect their habitat, also the acres of the forest save it, and finally save species for save species for instinct. But we have, unfortunately, we are faced with one of the biggest problems that is the meaning in Ecuador, deforestation, use of biological resources, agriculture, pollution in the air, water, and land. But I think that the meaning is the worst that we have because all the Ecuador are in the mean, illegal and legal mean. And that is all, thank you. All right. Thank you. Finally, oh, are, you, are you still going? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, and I finally say to say that the most exciting thing for me is without a doubt to go into file and discover new species because I know that if I discover a new species, I'm going to protect the forest. And protect the forest for me is the most important part because it's always something new. And if I have a new species, it's is not new for uh, their fantastic animals. It's not only new species, uh, they are all the animals, all the frogs, all the amphibians and reptiles, because I also study reptiles, are fantastic. And it's not only an animal, it's an animal that saves another animals. And I invite you to take care and to take action to protect the forest. Thank you. Thanks, Daniela. That's, that's fantastic. And that was, Partly the question I was going to ask you is, you know, what is what is the most meaningful, what is the most exciting part of the work that you do? Because I know for myself, when I go to the rainforest to find frogs, it's it's often that there's other animals too that excite me sometimes even more, even the insects. Um, and just, you know, when we talk about these things, it's it's much more than just the stu subject that we're looking at. Um, but I'm interested in the the problems with the mining that you mentioned. Um, can you explain to people watching? What is it about the mining that is harmful to the frogs? Uh, okay. Mining is, I think, that the worst part of the that in front frogs because uh, the mining that occurs to you, uh, uh, pollution to the air, to the water, and to the land. Also, uh, the illegal mining uh, is destroyed all the forests of Ecuador. Also, the, the government of Ecuador uh, they give to the meanings all the Ecuador. If you want to do meaning in Ecuador, you can go and do meaning. If you don't protect that, uh, because, because the government of Ecuador authorizes that. You can do meaning in Ecuador if you want. And we don't know what to do, but yes, we don't. <laughs> we, do. we know that is to protect the area of that. Also, uh, I reserve the Cominga, I uh, have a new species that protect uh, to, the, to the meaning. Uh, it's a glass frog, the uh, yellow nova tracheum, Nifarbulus uh, manduriacum, that is a species that save uh, acres of forest and they don't permit to, that the concession of meaning of gold uh, enter to this part of Ecuador. It's in the middle of Ecuador, in the north part, that is in the Pichincha province. Great. Thank you so much for that. And, and uh, now we're going to move on to Andy. Go for it. Hi. Well, 
Um, for a long time, I was always interested in entomology. I was like obsessed with studying insects and arachnids too. Um, what really inspired me to like study nature in general was keeping tarantulas. And I know that sounds weird. It really freaked my mom out <laughs> um, to see my basement full of all these beautiful tarantulas. I thought they were beautiful. But until recently, I watched a film called Fantastic Fungi uh, by Louis Schwartzberg. And in that film, there was this guy, Paul Stamets, who was like a genius when it comes to mushrooms, fungi, mycology is what it's really called. Um, and so I watched that film. I was inspired to go out, look for mushrooms because I, I had just heard about all of their medicinal benefits, um, all of the ways that they can save the world. And I saw that uh, Paul Stamets actually wrote this book called Mycelium Running. Um, and it talks about how mushrooms can save the world. Um, but what most people don't know is that when you see a mushroom, that's just the fruiting body of the organism. So most of the organism actually lives underground or in a tree, uh, like a decomposing tree. Um, and so when I went uh, inspired uh, going around town, just biking around the last few months during quarantine, I've, I just went looking for mushrooms almost every day. And I found a lot of oyster mushrooms um, that are pretty common. They grow everywhere. And I've been keeping this mycelium here. Um, all I did, this is kind of like a good way to, to use plastic waste and really any waste is I took the oyster mushrooms. I cut the stem off of them. I ate and cooked the rest um, with my family. They taste really good. Um, but I kept the stem and I put it in this brown paper bag. And then I sprayed the inside of the paper bag a few times with water just to get it really humid. And I put that in this plastic container that I got from the grocery store with used to have cookies in them. Um, and yeah, the mycelium has been growing with all that humidity in here. Uh, and you can actually see like right there, it kind of looks like coral. That's, uh, that's little tiny baby mushrooms, I guess you could call them, <laughs> or pins. Um, and so I read about oyster mushrooms in this book, and it actually explains how you can use oyster mushrooms and other mushrooms for mycofiltration. So you can filter water using the mycelium of mushrooms. And there's some mushrooms that kill certain types of bacteria like E. coli. And this is, this is really awesome because a lot of the times you see like places like factory farms just letting all of their uh, water run off and that's carrying all of this like disease, all of this um, bacteria that comes from the feces and it goes into our waterways uh, and contaminates all these ecosystems like James was talking about. We need uh, healthy water, a uh, clean water for our um, invertebrates, our aquatic invertebrates to survive. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show two short little clips of Paul Stamets explaining this in further detail because I'm not a leader or mycologist in, in this, but he is. All right, can you guys see that? We were involved in several experiments. I'm going to show you six, if I can, solutions for helping to save the world. Mattel Laboratories and I joined up in Bellingham, Washington. There were four piles saturated with uh, diesel and other petroleum waste. One was a control pile. One, one, one pile was treated with enzymes. One pile was treated with, uh, was treated with bacteria. And our pile, we inoculated with mushroom mycelium. The mycelium absorbs the oil. The mycelium is producing enzymes, peroxidases, that break carbon-hydrogen bonds. These are the same bonds that hold hydrocarbons together. So the mycelium becomes saturated with the oil, 
And then when we returned six weeks later, all the tarps were removed, all the other piles were dead, dark, and stinky. We came back to our pile, it was covered with hundreds of pounds of oyster mushrooms, and the color changed to a light form. The enzymes remanufactured the hydrocarbons into carbohydrates, fungal sugars. Some of these mushrooms are very happy mushrooms, they're very large. They're showing how much nutrition that they could obtain. But something else happened, which is an epiphany in, in my life. They sporulated, the spores attract insects, the insects laid eggs, eggs became larvae, birds then came bringing in seeds, and our pile became an oasis of life. Whereas the other three piles were dead, dark, and stinky, and the PAHs, the aromatic hydrocarbons, went from 10,000 parts per million to less than 200 in eight weeks. The last image the, we don't have, the entire pile was a green berm of life. These are gateway species, vanguard species that opened the door for, biologicals, uh, for other biological communities. So I invented burlap sacks, bunker spawn, and putting the mycelium using storm blown debris. You can take these burlap sacks and put them downstream from a farm that's producing E. coli or other waste or a factory with chemical toxins, and it leads to habitat restoration. So we set up a site in Mason County, Washington, and we've seen a dramatic decrease in the amount of coliforms. And I'll show you a graph here. This is a logarithm. All right. Um, another video I wanted to show is how mushrooms can save bees, which is really interesting. Deforestation is... causing zoonotic diseases to spread. When there is a loss of foraging bees, the population declines, mites and other diseases then begin to spiral out of control, and suddenly the whole colony collapses. I want to bring to you an epiphany that I've had that I think is just truly revolutionary. That the same mushrooms that can limit bird flu, H5N1 herpes, also positively affect bees and being able for them to control the viral burden. So we started doing experiments with bees. They're given extracts of the mycelium, the mycohoney. As the mycohoney increases, there is a radical decline in the viral pathogen payload. They can upregulate their immune system, give them a host defense antiviral shield, allow them to detoxify toxins, and allow them to be better pollinators. Dr. Steve Shepard, who I'm working with, as an entomologist of 39 years of experience studying bees, I'm unaware of any reports that extend the life of worker bees more than this. All right. All right, well, that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Um, I, if I have time, I, I kind of want to show you guys one last thing, one second. All right. So uh, this is a close up of, of that um, slide that he showed, that Paul Stamets showed. And you can see like you, you literally just stack these burlap sacks that are colonized with mycelium um, in the waterway. Uh, and then eventually it creates this uh, pristine habitat for all life. Um, whereas without this, it would just become this fully contaminated uh, waterway, which is not good. Um, but what I think is most important to take out of this is that um, we, we are using another organism for our benefit, and we are also um, helping that organism. So we're, we're giving uh, these oyster mushrooms food and a place to grow, and in return, they're cleaning our water. And I think that's so amazing. I mean, not only that, but they're giving us nutrients that we can eat too, like a very healthy mushroom that kills cancer. It's high in protein. It's uh, full of vitamin D. Um, amazing stuff. Um, I don't think I have time to talk about the rest of this. <laughs> But uh, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. That was fascinating. Um, I have one quick question for you. So 
what I found really interesting about what you're saying is, you know, normally these days we often think about the way to find solutions to really big environmental problems is technology. Everyone talks about technology and and it seems like a lot of what you're talking about with these mushrooms is almost the reverse, that maybe maybe we already have a lot of these solutions at our fingertips and just don't realize it. Like, how does that make you feel? Like, is that kind of what you see or? Yeah, for sure. I think um, we have to look back into nature. I mean, it, it kind of is technology. You see Paul Stamets using a mushroom to save bees and the bees are helping us out by pollinating our, our food and also giving us honey. And we're giving them a place to live and flowers to pollinate. Um, that's, I mean, that's kind of technology. It's like a biotechnology or biomimicry. Um, and that, that is kind of what I wanted to get into is like, we can, we can use our knowledge of nature um, to benefit other organisms and they can also benefit us in return. Uh, and that's, that's like symbiosis is like the term for that. It's a mutualistic uh, relationship. And that right now is definitely like one of the most important things. I mean, we're so lucky to be super intelligent species with consciousness that evolved out of nature and we can look back at nature and like work with it, you know? It's so crazy that we can do that. And we just need more people looking into that for sure. Thanks, that's, that's inspiring. And, and yeah, it makes so much sense. Okay, so now I believe we're gonna go to some of the Q and A's that we've received during these talks. So if I can figure out how to do this, so I'll start in a second. Okay. So some of these questions are, are kind of like not for a specific person. <clears throat> so when I ask them, like I'll, I'll each of you can have a, a chance at, at taking a swing at it and we'll go um, in order of, of, of who spoke just so there's no confusion. So the first question is, who are some of your favorite explorers and adventurers? So James. That's a very good question because there are just so many to, to, um, to choose from, but maybe quite cliche, but Charles Darwin was just, just incredible um, at how he pioneered um, all the all his thoughts about evolution. And I was fortunate enough to go to the Galapagos um, a few years ago and sort of witness all these things for myself. And I think that was actually following in his footsteps. It was quite an important sort of step in my journey going through and learning about natural history. So for that reason, I think he's one of my favorite and, and so important to me. Great. What about you, Daniela? Are there any people yeah. that you look up to or admire? Or? I think that all of herpetologists for me, but in Ecuador, I think that my advisor, Juan Manuel Guayasamin, that he works with glass frogs and they had a lot of contributions for the country. Also, uh, they have a uh, tumor that is Lynch and Dulman from the U USA, that they made great contributions uh, with books or publications that inspires uh, the research, I think. Great. Fantastic. What about you, Andy? Although I think we know who your mushroom uh, mushroom yeah, but is. Paul Stamets, but um, I think Richard Evans Schultes, that's that's definitely one of my like idols right now. He he traveled through the Amazon in like the forties and fifties, I think. Um, for twelve years, lived with all these different tribes and described all these new species of plants. I thought that was really cool. Great, thanks. Um, next question, really quickly. Is there a certain species that each of you has on your bucket list that you would just would love to see someday if you could? Start with James. Again, there are just so many to choose from, but um, whew, can I sort of, um, go with rather than a specific species, I think um, just any species that's that's sort of new to, to science I sort of come across or new to a particular region. It's just any anyone that I would like to see. So for example, in the, in, the, in my garden even, I found uh, five species of undescribed springtails and one that's never been seen in the UK before. So stuff like these, sightings like these are stuff that really keep me going and, and just bring home how anybody can sort of make contributions, um, even if it's in their own back garden. So 
yeah, if I was if I was to choose one species, though, it would be the rose chafer, um, which is an amazingly big, um, sort of shiny green beetle, which um, is fairly common in the right areas in the UK, mainly sort of the the sandy, perhaps ch chalky grasslands, but you can get them in in your garden as well if you're lucky. So. The day that I see one of those, I'm going to be very, very happy, I must say. Great. What about you, Daniela? It's difficult. <laughs> we have six hundred species or more in Ecuador, but I think that a genus that is interesting is a telopus, that uh, these genus are the, the species that are repairing in Ecuador. And they, um, they affect with the DB, that is a mushroom, that, that affect the skin of the frogs. And I think that is one of the most beautiful that I want to see in, in the way. That's great. Thanks. And Andy, what about you? Do you have a favorite uh, long lost mushroom you want to see or what? Uh, <laughs> that's so difficult. Um, I mean, there's so many mushrooms I want to see. There's so many frogs I'd want to see and insects. Um, I don't know, I guess. <laughs> I guess I really want to see one of the um, uh, Hercules beetles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that works. Great. I would love to see one of those too. Okay. We do have a lot of questions, but we are coming a little bit close to the end. So I'm going to ask a question and also combine this with each of you has like a minute or so to give us any final thoughts you have. Um, but the question I do want to pull out, because I think it would be helpful to people watching, um, says, I'm passionate about these topics, but I don't think I will go to school for them. Are there any resources you would suggest that people could turn to to learn more about some of these topics that you're interested in? So if each of you has anything to recommend or suggest, and then at the same time, um, if there's any final thoughts that you want to share with folks, and we'll start with James. Uh, I'll actually combine that with another question that I read in the Q&A and that's um, about citizen science projects. So yes. um, one of the best ways that uh, you can sort of learn about the stuff that's around you is by being particularly practical in your learning. So going out and, and seeing exactly what you can find and sort of along the way, whenever you find a, a cool invertebrate, learn all the facts about it and sort of why it needs to be conserved. And so you can do that by going through uh, citizen science projects. So. In the UK, there's the Biological Records Centre, and if you check out their website, you can sort of see all the, all the different recording schemes that are being sort of going on in mo in, at the moment. And there are so many of them you can get involved in, even just in your garden. Um, and also, I know Andy's a fan of this as well, but iNaturalist is such a good resource for if you find something that you don't know, you can get identifications, or if you find something you don't do know, you can sort of submit the record to the website and scientists will pick it up and often give you cool facts about it or you could research yourself. So um, yeah, pretty much uh, one of the best ways of learning doing these sort of citizen science projects and um, that you can find on these uh, websites like iNaturalist and yeah, it's really worthwhile, I'd say. Thanks, James. That's great. And, and yeah, iNaturalist, I love using iNaturalist. It's, it's fun, it's informative, it gets people involved. Um, I'm a big, a big fan of citizen science. All right, and Daniela, how about you? I think that read and go for it. Reading is the most important thing that we should do because in literature, uh, there is almost everything in scientific papers. And if you want to have experience, you should go to the laboratories, get involved in projects or the topic do you like. Also in my experience, I think that the best thing is to do what you think you like, and if you don't, uh, then you can keep uh, trying in other branches. And I know that there are many labs looking for volunteers, um, but that is not like answer. Thanks, Daniela. And, and something I wanted to, to add a comment on to your point about reading, um, I think it's also really important to keep in mind that even some of the stuff we read about these animals isn't the full picture because of the work that, that you and other people are doing is adding information to that. Um, I know I've been wrong a lot of times about the assumptions that I've made about what some of these frogs do until I've just sat in the rainforest and observed them for hours, like, like the videos you showed us about what are they actually doing? And that takes a lot of time and effort and it adds to the literature. And, and I find that just as exciting as to find out that, you know, we, we don't know everything yet. 
Um, and, and the kind of work that you and, and your groups are doing is, is adding to that. So thanks. And now, Andy, how about you? Uh, I have a strong opinion, uh, and it goes like this. I don't think you need to use up all of your money to go to school to learn about these topics. I mean, everything I've learned has been from using iNaturalist, from uh, researching online, looking at research papers, reading books, but really, yeah, just going out into the field, taking pictures of all the organisms you find and documenting that. And then when you go home, you can upload that onto a database like iNaturalist and figure out what species that is and read up all about it. Thanks. I, I, I really appreciate that because you know, I do a lot of science communication and something that I, I hear from people often is, you know, we'll be talking about things we found, for example, and someone will start a sentence by saying, well, I'm not a scientist, but here's this really neat thing I found. And, and just like you said, I have a very strong opinion about the way people think that, oh, just because I didn't go to school for this means I'm not an expert or I'm not a scientist. And no, just like all of you have shown, you know, you're young people early in your career, I consider you guys experts in what you do, like irrelevant to how old you are or where you went to school or what you're doing next. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, a lot of the feelings and thoughts you all have expressed goes to that point of how do we get more people involved and excited in science and in the work that we do and in protecting the environment. And I think it's, it's breaking down some of those barriers that this is you know, a thing for these people or those people or, you know, it's over on that side of the fence when actually we're all part of nature. And, and I think, you know, what all of you have talked about is how do we how do we engage that more with the people in our lives and the people that need to care about these things. So thank you all for giving your talks today for doing what you do, sharing your passion, getting me excited about mushrooms and leeches. And I was already excited about frogs, but I'm more excited now. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Also, um, as Callie had, uh, I think in the, in the chat, mentioned folks' um, social media handles. There were some questions we didn't get to. Um, I'm sure people would be happy to, to get messages if you want to reach out to them. And, and yeah, don't forget to follow Reserva YLT and Callie's amazing work. And uh, stay tuned for more awesome stuff. Yay, that was so good. We had so many people tuning in for this one, sending so much love to you, Dr. Colby, Andy, James, and Daniela from all around the world, um, saying how they've never been more passionate about mushrooms slash leeches. So, you know, I think this is a good session <laughs> to, to kind of, you know, kind of um, end, you almost end Youthathon with. Um, it reminds us, you know, how even some of the things in our own backyard can give us the most joy uh, for our planet. Uh, you don't have to, you know, live in, um, you know, for some of us, we might do, we might live in the rainforest, but uh, some of the coolest things can also be in your backyard too. So thank you all so much for being here. Please give them some love on social media. If any of you were not able to, um, you know, kind of come on as a full participant today, but, you know, you have some questions for them, please DM them, um, message them, um, show them some love for their work. Um, they're doing some great stuff. So thank you guys so much for sharing. That was, that was really cool. Thanks so much, Callie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh my gosh. It just keeps getting better and better. I love, I, I can't believe this is almost coming to um, its conclusion. I'm changing out some of our um, presenters so we can get started for the next one. But thank you all again um, from Reserva for being here with us. Um, but also thank you for everyone watching, tuning in um, on the YouTube. I've seen so many different people from so many different places um, messaging me, messaging us, and, and just letting us know how, um, how happy and thankful you are um, for just this space. Um, someone said earlier today, we're unlearning and learning a lot of things during this moment. And um, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't be more thankful to, uh, to share this time with each of you. And, and, just take some of that infectious energy. It's been keeping me up. Um, it's been it's been actually fueling me. Um, I've fun fact for you. I've never actually stayed up 
all night before. And so I'm going on almost all night. So it's, it's fueling me, trust me. Thank you, thank you so much for giving um, all of the love to all of the panelists.